newsroom from the BBC World Service with me, Paul Moss. That's it for now. Goodbye. This is the BBC World Service reporting on the impact of sand mining in Cambodia. Even though it seems like the most trivial thing in the world, it is actually the most important solid substance on Earth. Sand is used to make everything from skyscrapers to smartphones, but the world is running out of usable supplies. To fuel Cambodia's construction boom, it's being dredged from the Mekong River, and that comes at a cost. In the last five years, it just, be, it just have a lot of fish, but now I cannot collect fish anymore. Livelihoods and lives are being put at risk as the drive to develop the country accelerates. Many people are living along the river, but while they are sleeping, they fall into the water because of the river color. Join me, Robin Markwell, as I assess the environmental and human impact. Running out of sand. Today at 10 GMT. Hello, I'm Grey Jackson, and up next on the BBC World Service is the climate question. This week, listeners are taking over the show with their queries, mysteries, and quandaries. From where the climate change could cause more volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, to how will power a new fleet of electric vehicles? Plus, is global warming reversible? Join us after the latest BBC World Service news. BBC News with Neil Nunes. The Biden administration has said a Supreme Court decision to allow a Texas state law on migration to take effect will damage border security. It assumes powers that are traditional in the remit of federal officials, giving Texan law officers the authority to arrest and deport migrants who cross from Mexico illegally. A member of Haiti's Transitional Council has said the country cannot be ruled by criminals. Leslie Voltaire hit out at the gangs, who last week forced the resignation of Prime Minister Adrian Henry. Australia's Foreign Minister has said her country will seek to manage differences with China wisely, following a meeting with her counterpart Wang Yi in Canberra. Fanny Wong said a range of shared interests had been discussed, as well as Beijing's human rights record. The U.S. says it's received mixed signals from Niger after the military government recently revoked an accord allowing American forces to operate in the country. A State Department spokesman said it was seeking clarification. Two miners have been killed and eight more are missing after an explosion at a coal mine in Pakistan. A search and rescue operation is underway. Two white former police officers in the U.S. state of Mississippi have been jailed for their part in the torture and sexual abuse of two black men. Four others will be sentenced later this week. Researchers in the Netherlands say they've been able to eliminate HIV from cells in a laboratory by targeting the DNA of the disease. It's raised hopes of an eventual cure. And an investigation is underway at the staff at the London Clinic where the Princess of Wales underwent surgery in January, allegedly tried to view her private health information. Details of Kate's condition have not been disclosed. BBC News. Welcome to the Climate Question from the BBC World Service. This week, listeners like me are taking over the show with our questions. I'm your host, Greer Jackson, and you listeners are back with your questions about climate change. I would like to know if there are any expected geological effects of climate change. How much of global warming is caused by the heat given off by a human body? I want to know how bad avocados are for the environment. Answers to those and more coming right up. Three familiar faces or voices are here with me to tackle your climate questions. I have Justin Rowland, the BBC's climate editor. Hi, yeah. We have Akshat Rathi, Bloomberg's senior climate reporter and author of Climate Capitalism. Hello. Hi. And Tamsin Edwards, professor of climate change in King's College, London. Hello, Tamsin. Hi there. How are we all? What have we all been up to? Oh, Actually. it's an exciting week because my book is out in the US this week. Congratulations! Oh, well, that's exciting. Tick. Tamsin, what have you been up to at work? 
I have been obsessing about a big analysis I've been working on predicting sea level rise to the year 2300, bringing together lots of different computer model predictions with machine learning, trying to get the numbers out for deadline. Basically. Wow. Okay. That's so interesting. I think it's really interesting to like look beyond 2100, which is normally where people stop, because obviously once you've got a stock of carbon in the atmosphere, it's going to go on changing things for some time. Exactly. 2100 is not that long away when we start to plan infrastructure and so on, so we really need to go further. Exactly. I've been, I've, I've been doing a really interesting story this week looking at the battle for these metallic nodules on the deep sea floor which uh, the miners claim are essential for the new renewable transition but the green activists say will destroy a pristine environment so that's a really interesting conflict there. Where have you been doing that story, Justin? Here in London. Here in London. Not you haven't been anywhere. Trawling the deep ocean, so <laughs> no, just here. It strikes me your job is quite different day to day, Tamsin, because last time we spoke to you, you were like building a weather station in South America or something, weren't you? <laughs> That's right. Uh, actually, I actually have to say, sitting at my laptop is the norm. The going up a mountain in Chile is very much not the norm, and I'm only just recovering. <laughs> yeah, I think laptop work is, is the norm for most of us, in honest, in truth. It's true for you, Akshan. Well, I get to travel for work, which is nice, just to be able to go and see where these solutions are being built, but not to the bottom of the ocean, because I don't know which way we can do that. No. <laughs> what solutions have you been looking at? So, I'm obsessed with how to make steel using only electricity and using no emissions. Wow, okay, and because steel's a bigger contributor. 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions, more than aviation and shipping online. Mm, okay, so it's important. Let's skate on over to our first listener question since this is a listener-led program. Hello, my name is Carla and I'm from Oregon in the USA. I would like to know if there are any expected geological effects of climate change, such as changes in earthquake patterns or volcano eruptions, that might result from changes in sea level or other climate-related changes. Now, Tamsin, when I first heard this question, I thought, no, really? And then I looked into it and I was like, oh my gosh, it's true. Just explain how that can be the case. It sounds a bit bonkers, doesn't it? But if you think about it, lots of things that are affected by climate change on the planet are heavy, uh, by which I mean ice and water. So if you do lose ice when glasses retreat, for example, it kind of reduces the stress on the Earth's crust, and you can get more, more earthquakes and maybe even more volcanic activity. This has been seen in a study for Iceland about 5,000 years ago. And the same with water as well. So in the Himalayas, they see changes and just tiny changes in earthquakes, micro seismicity that go through the seasonal cycles of the monsoon. So when there's lots of heavy rain falling on the earth, it sort of dampens the seismicity. And then when the monsoon stop, they see a peak. Wow, okay, and you say micro. I mean, how much is it even a point on the Richter scale? Basically, this is small scale stuff. Um, we have seen much bigger changes in the past, of course. It was over the Earth's history, we've seen really big changes in climate over a really long period of time. So you do get bigger changes in the past, but at the moment it's uh, it's smaller. Actually, it's in, in Greenland, um, they also see maybe some more earthquakes, I think, in the summer when there's less ice, and that that seems to be increasing as well. And could the opposite be true? You talk about more rainfall, less rainfall. What about in conditions like drought? Might there also be implications there? Yeah, good question. I was thinking about this. And there's a kind of indirect effect of climate change. So when we get drought and we have to think about our water resources, humans tend to do things like extract from groundwater, like we see this in the USA, and fill up reservoirs and drain them again. And again, those changes can cause small earth rates, actually. But those changes in ice do have a big, other big impacts, don't they? There's something, that you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but isostatic rebound? So oh, when the ice so melts, the, the earth, you know, it kind of melts in places like the Himalayas, the earth begins to change its its position because the weight's being off, lifted off it. And interestingly, a lot of the kind of sea level rise that we see is actually land sinking as a result of the changes of ice in ice around the globe. Yeah, that's right. So that's what I meant when I said that when you get the glasses retreating and you lose that big heavy weight, you're sort of losing that dampening, you get that earth lifted up and in some places the earth going down and sort of counterbalance to that. So and places like Bangladesh, a lot of the sea level rise you see in Bangladesh is actually a function of isostatic rebound rather than rising sea level. Yeah, we have a combination. Yeah, we have the uplift in the humans and then we also have the extraction of resources. All of these things can make sea level worse exactly. The other thing, we made this program about Greenland, and the other thing that I found absolutely fascinating about this was that because the ice sheet is so big there in Greenland, it has a gravitational pulling effect on the oceans, and as it melts, it's releasing that water, 
and that also causes sea level rise to drop in Greenland, but then actually further away it causes the sea level to rise, which I just found fascinating. Exactly, we're actually more affected by melting of the Antarctic ice sheet up here in, in the UK and, and the rest of Europe, rather than from Greenland, which is close by. Because? Because basically as you lose ice, you lose the kind of gravitational pull of the ice on the water, the water kind of falls away. So close to Greenland, the sea level drops because it's actually kind of not sucked so, in by yeah, gravity. Not drawn in. Yeah, and it sort of distributes around the rest of the world. But sorry, on this, there is another effect, isn't there? That the spinning of the Earth draws the ocean water into the tropics. So, you know, ironically, the tropics are disproportionately affected by melting of both poles, aren't they? Because the water draws into the middle of the ocean. There's all kinds of effects. The, the temperature of the water makes an impact. So when you get things like warm spots, El Ninos, ocean currents, they like all change. It's really hard. I, mean, I, I have you're a really really job. I think the global <laughs> average sea level, regional sea level is really, Whoa, really, 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 really hard. Next, we have a listener, Daniel. He says, I'm in China, where we have the most electric cars around the world, and the number is still increasing very, very fast. Our electricity grid is under pressure. We drop oil and we pick up batteries instead. His question is, do we have enough power plants to support such a high demand of electricity? Akshat. So China thought about this rarely, right? The energy transition has been going on for some time, but the China's EV transition has been two decades in the making. And their entire reason was to try and move away from fossil fuels, not really about carbon. They just didn't want to import so much oil that was not available in China, and they had to go to Saudi Arabia to get it. Last year, China alone installed enough solar panels that the entire United States has done in history. And they did that in one year. So electricity isn't really a problem that China has to deal with when it comes to whether it can get enough power to get electric cars. I mean, maybe what Daniel's referring to is the fact that China has experienced blackouts in the last few summits, hasn't it? That it has, and that's partly to do with the sheer amount of changes it is making to the grid, and it has to figure out how to manage it well. And that's the reason why coal continues to play a big role in China's transition, right? They are still building the most number of coal power plants in the world, which sounds weird. They're doing all the solar in the world and so much coal. But that and wind, I mean, of course, yeah. <laughs> What's the trajectory like for EVs in China? It's spectacular. So the first goal that they'd set in recent years was to reach 20% of all new car sales by 2025 being EVs. Well, they crossed that last year. And now the new goal was supposed to be 40% by 2030. They are going to cross that this year. Actually, it's not just electric vehicles in the way that we might think of them four wheelers, but actually two and three wheeled vehicles are really taking off in Asia in particular. So on the trajectory to net zero, you're going to require all these solutions that need to go at pace. None of them are working at pace, right? Because net zero is so hard. The only one that is working is two and three wheeler electric vehicles. Justin, let's move on to the next question. It kind of relates to what Akshat's been talking about. So wrap your ears around this. Hello, my name is Bill, and I'm from Philadelphia, USA. I wanted to know, can there be significant growth and investment in renewable energy capacity? And is it still be true that the greenhouse gas emissions and fossil energy extraction is increasing? Justin. Yeah, this is a kind of corrective to uh, Akshat's, uh, you know, optimistic uh, picture of China. Yeah, it, unfortunately, it is true. We are seeing significant growth in renewables and simultaneously we can see growth in fossil fuel emissions. I mean, there has been a massive growth in renewable investment. There's a great stat from the International Energy Agency, which is kind of the world's energy watchdog. Um, and it found that for every dollar invested in oil and gas, we're seeing $1.7 invested in renewables great news you know renewables overtaking it we've seen oil and gas but you know energy demand still still continues to increase and unfortunately electricity is just 20 percent of total energy demand and you think about places like india and africa there's a huge amount of development happening in those countries people who didn't have things like uh, you know, motorbikes or cars or have the opportunities to heat them, or even for example to take their first holiday flight and they're beginning to do all of those things and increase their energy use so we are seeing an increased use of energy i mean i was going to go on i don't know if we've got time i was going to go and talk about the jevron's paradox which is this economist who looked at the british industrial revolution he was like hold on a second all the machines we're using are getting so much better at using energy 
but energy demand continues to rise. So his paradox was why, if it's so much more efficient, are we using more energy? And if you think about it, we use more energy because the more efficient it gets to use energy, the more we can do with it. And the more we can do with it, the more stuff we can make, the more we can sell. So it's in our interest, it's kind of incentive to use more energy. Anything you want to add, Jack? I'm just going to say it's Jevon's paradox, not Jevon's. Yes, you're absolutely right. Good. Well, thank you. enough corn, for example. I agree this is a serious roadblock, but I wonder if vertical farming could be the solution. Okay, quick 101 on biofuels. It's a fuel with a similar chemical composition to fossil fuels like petrol or gasoline, but it's extracted from crops like corn, and it could be used instead of jet fuel, for instance, in airplane. Has anyone been to a vertical farm before, I wonder? Yeah, I went to a couple of them actually. One just outside Paris, a uh, start called Jungle, and then one in Singapore called Grow Grace. When you're inside, you're outside Paris or outside Singapore, it's the same atmosphere because the temperature is controlled, the humidity is controlled, and there are these lights that look purplish. It feels Very like you're in a It feels disco. like you're in a spaceship, is what or I found spaceship. when I went here. Yep, yep. They sometimes play music to the, the crop, so you know, you do feel like you're in a disco. <laughs> no, they don't. You're joking. No, seriously, they, they do. They play music to is the crop. Is there a scientific reason for playing music? Yeah, they, they think, at least in Grow Grace's case, they think that that particular species of lettuce grew bread or because no. they were playing music. Oh, gee, no, you're this is not a scientific No, no I can't. I'm not saying it's scientifically true. About that. <laughs> I mean, for anyone who's never been to one, how would you describe it? It typically is, it's a huge shed, essentially. It could be in an office block, or it could just be in an industrial farm. And it is rows and racks of just herbs, most of the time, or green salad, right, lettuce. That's growing in rows and rows with different lighting, depending on which st stage of growth it is in, or which stage of uh, day light it is in because you know if you're in paris you might go through winter and summer but the plants inside that vertical farm they do not it's basically. summer always yeah. <laughs> you get the best hold, hold on so you've got to i mean so there it's, so it's not using natural sunlight it's using lights so then, then obviously is a huge energy demand i know the lights are leds right which is quite a development huh? so the entire cell is you're going to use just energy mostly to run this thing because the water gets recycled you do add some nutrients obviously but it is temperature control it is um, light controlled and it is power hungry and so vertical farms have been really struggling right now with where power prices are and some of them have gone bankrupt let's just circle back to Dante's question which is more about land use right and as Akshat is saying you know because they're stacked in trays like bookshelves shelves after shelves, shelves it can save a lot of space and I looked up whether you can grow um, bio crops in these situations and you can some varieties are perfectly suitable for vertical land so in answer to your question Dante yes and as Akshat says you can grow them year round and because the environment is so controlled we could grow them bigger with less inputs like water and fertilizer. Uh, except the energy. Yes, I was about to say, oh, okay. but there is a big but here, and that is they're really expensive to set up for one, and also really expensive to run because of this high energy requirement, and that might have a big climate cost as well, depending on where that energy comes from, right? If it's renewables, fine. If it's coming from fossil fuels, less good. Since we're talking about farms, uh, we're going to go over to another relevant listener question that's landed in the inbox. Hello, I'm Elle from the UK, and I often get told about how bad avocados are for the environment. I want to know how bad they are in comparison to other crops, whether they really are as detrimental as everybody talks about, or are they just a poster fruit for unsustainable farming? 
Now, I'm a big lover of avocado, so this question's close to my heart. Tamsin, you're nodding along. <laughs> They're very good for you. <laughs> but actually, I mean, as I've demonstrated, I'm sure lots of people listening don't want to be giving up their avocados in the fight against climate change. So don't keep us on our <laughs> toes. Tell us what's the cost of avocados if there is one. I also don't want to give up on avocados. I had never had one until I moved to this country at the age of 21, because it's not something that, you know, got imported into India, at least at that time. And so the biggest cost on carbon footprint for food is what you eat, not where it comes from. The transport emissions that are attached to things that are coming from abroad, you know, they might come from South America, they might sometimes even come from Australia, are a tiny fraction. And so if you really want to cut your emissions, look at beef and other meat products and reduce that. Food miles make up generally less than a percent of the overall carbon footprint of food. That said, there are some foods that are flown in, like soft fruits, yeah, right? And strawberries, like highly perishable ones. So it doesn't apply to everything, but it's generally, it's a good rule of thumb, right? It's the food itself, not where it comes from. Because if bananas are bought on boats, and that's fine, and melons and stuff like that. But if you have the soft fruit, as you say, uh, that's flown in, and it will, it's kind of pretty obvious which fruit they are. If you look at them, then they do have a very high food market. Right. right, or caviar, you know, those kinds of things which people can afford. They afford by uh, getting it uh, flown in sometimes. Isn't the issue with avocados that they use tons of water in normally very dry places? It's a bit like almonds in California. They're just not really a very suitable crop for a dry place. Right, and eating local for other reasons, like supporting local farmers, supporting communities, those are very good reasons to eat local, but also the seasonal benefits of eating local. And so you're supporting not extractive farming that consumes too much water in other places. And at the risk of sounding like a total downer, is an issue health-wise for other fat? They've got loads of cholesterol in them. No, it's good fats. No, no. Oh, so okay. I was going to say, I'm going to chime in. I've read yeah, a lot yeah. of good things about the fats. Okay, listen, I, I, I'm I'm just, I feel like... Do you hate I'm avocados? So just so <laughs> You're the one picking holes today instead yeah. of me. We've rolled the, reverse. The nice thing about diet, actually, is it's one of those things that really shows the example of co-benefit because a, a diet that's good for the planet is generally good for humans as well. So lots of fruit and veg, lots of beans and lentils, uh, stuff like that. So, so really kind of plant-based. Uh, doesn't mean no meat or dairy if that's what you want to have but sort of minimizing those as much as possible saving them more for a treat or a special occasion good quality this kind of thing and actually what's good for the planet tends to be good for us too we don't talk about the co-benefits but it's not just things like diet i mean we're talking about evs earlier there are huge benefits in that there's lots of not lots of tailpipe emissions that people then breathe in our children then breathe in it has huge benefits exactly we've moved i think away from that conversation of, of thinking about climate change being about giving things up and having a hard life and you know hair shirt environmentalism they used to call it right and then and much more about what's the world we want to create what are all the ways that we're going to make it better that also benefit the climate thank you tamsin our next question is from someone who wants to remain anonymous. They say, is it possible for climate change to be reversed? Justin, another difficult uh, one for you. Yeah, okay, <laughs> a really tough question. That is a really big question as well. Look, in theory, yes, we could reverse climate change. And if you think about it, it's quite simple. You know, climate change is caused by the greenhouse gases we've pumped into the atmosphere. We can take them out the world's going to not just cool less, but will actually cool down. And some of the gases are quite easy to deal with. I'm being positive here. <laughs> Methane, for example, stays in the atmosphere for 20 years. It's about 30% of the human-induced climate change that we've had so far. So it's a big component of it. There is background methane that's produced naturally. But if we can reduce the amount that human beings emit, then we could begin to slow climate change with that. A little bit more tricky when you come to the main uh, climate gas, which is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. You'll be able to get the exact figure for each atmosphere, but for centuries, sometimes for millennia, for thousands of years. So it hangs around for a long time. So the question is really, can we take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? There are ways to do it, but they're certainly not developed at scale at the moment. And the other thing about them, as with so many technologies associated with climate change, is they are really expensive. Yes, at the moment, but they do have sort of really fundamental challenges because of the nature of the technology. What are these technologies you're describing? There are literal machines that draw in air and they have a process that strips the carbon dioxide out and then you can store that. Another more controversial way of doing it is using biomass trees as they grow obviously absorb carbon dioxide if you burn them and then capture the carbon dioxide from the trees 
then it's negative so long as you grow more trees. So notionally <laughs> it's possible, but it's really hard. Oh, now, Tamsin. So many things. <laughs> yeah, but... well, I will thank you for sure. I, I do want to actually pull back a little bit to the beginning as well, because you said climate change can be reversed. I'm going to pick you up on that, because actually we would say that global warming could be reversed. Yep. And actually there's a lot, and I really care about this because I study the ice sheets and the glasses. And actually the impacts of global warming, in other words, the wider climate change, only parts of that could be reversed. Just before you go on, just I'm sure many people won't know the difference between climate change and global warming. Exactly, right? exactly. And I think, you know, we so often use them interchangeably and I do myself. And it's, it's really understandable because in many ways we do think of them as meaning the same thing. But when I say global warming, I mean the temperature of the the air and the oceans going up you know we talk about one and a half degrees of warming two degrees of warming but then that has impacts on the whole planet and that is what we would call the, the wider climate change or the climate impacts so for example melting of mountain glaciers or of the big ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica I study these and these are things that we really think would not be reversible and actually the last report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that these effects would last for hundreds to thousands of years and that's very much not reversible. I'll try and finish on a more positive note though. I was just, yeah, I, I, because it's a really, it's a tough one for us to sort of even think about, you know, to even understand what that means. But Arctic sea ice is something that has been decreasing, so that's the floating ice over the top of the northern regions of the planet. That would also regrow, we think, if we cooled the planet back down. But huge challenges with being able to cool that planet back down quickly, um, as opposed to slowly, as, as we've heard. We need to move on to our final question. And again, this is another facet of climate change I had never thought about. And Tamsin, it's going to involve you doing some back of the envelope calculations. How's your maths? Good. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I very, hope. Happy it's very back okay, well, your exam question is about to be set. I see you've got your pen ready. Let's hear it. Hello, my name is Tony from Australia, and I would like to know how much should global warming 